When you think of a typical home landscape, you think of mostly ornamentals, um, but there's no reason why edible plants can't be thrown in there in the mix. We're gonna go take a look at a home landscape that's both pretty and productive. I'm standing here in the most beautiful vegetable garden surrounded by tomatoes and eggplants, and I see basil, uh, some grapes, all kinds of peppers, really prolific and spectacular vegetable garden right here. I'm standing here with Jeremy Leckage of Nashville Foodscapes. So you've helped start this garden and get this going? Correct, this is one of my many offices. This is an example of a more, you could say formal garden, you know, contained in a space with a fence around it, um, which is really a great way for a high product, to get high production in a garden. Right. Um, especially when you have uh, critters that, that also want to enjoy in the abundance that you're growing. The raised beds help with that a bit. They also really help with just kind of organizing the garden and to be able to kind of think about rotation and delineation of pathway and beds. It's a nice way to really keep it clean. For a vegetable garden, when you're trying to get high production, this is a really convenient way to make that happen. And with plant rotation, you're talking about planting the different families in each area. Totally. So you don't kind of leach the soil of those certain nutrients. When you plant certain plants in the same spot, year after year, it can actually breed diseases. As far as the history of this site, was this mm -hmm. just yard? Uh, you know a few years back at one point it was yard and then when i arrived it was a big garden but there was no raised beds there was you know some minor pathways that went through but what was happening was it was always getting compacted because there wasn't clear uh pathways right. and so when we put the raised beds in it really helped um, so that at this point, the only place that gets compaction are the pathways and the beds stay loose. And what's been really nice about these raised beds also is that we put really good soil in to the point where this garden is not being irrigated. There's no irrigation uh, system in, in, in place here. Now it gets a watering uh, once in a while, especially now because we're in a drought. Right. But um, the nutrients that uh, we brought in were such that it allowed for, uh, for these plants to really set deep roots. We also did not put any landscape fabric underneath because if you do that, then you prevent the roots from going down. And right. the roots of most plants will go down further than six, eight, 10 inches of your raised bed. And you really do want that right. because then they build this resilience into the deeper soils right. and it helps them to tap into the water that will be in the ground even during a drought. Well, I do have to comment to how tidy it is and it's, mm -hmm. and it's actually pleasing to look at from the house, you know, a lot of people think of a vegetable garden as this kind of messy place, but this is a nice looking formal vegetable garden. I think it adds visually to the yard. A lot of the work we're doing is trying to say, hey, growing food can be beautiful. It doesn't have to be an eyesore. I'm sure when people come visit, they say, oh, that's neat. Let's go take a look around there. No one says, hey, go tour me around your grass. Right. <laughs> Another benefit of having a garden, uh, edible plants, uh, even just a diverse landscape, is that you get to meet your neighbors, yeah. right? And I mean that on multiple levels. Like when you have fresh produce, it's really easy to go to a neighbor's house and say, hey, it's nice to meet you. Here are some fresh tomatoes from my garden. Right. But you also get to meet your non-human neighbors, yeah. right? Which are, which are plants, which are lots of insects, uh -huh. which are really beneficial for um, our life. They pollinate the things we like to eat. Yeah. Um, they, they kill the pests that, that like to eat all, the plants that we want to grow. Um, so you get to meet um, all these incredible neighbors that are all around us, human and non-human. Yeah, I mean, more than beneficial, necessary. Necessary, yeah. essential. Essential, yeah. yeah. So here's a tree that's an ornamental and an edible. So it's kind of a best of both worlds, which I know you try to accomplish a lot. Yep, um, absolutely. It's a crab apple tree, right? Yep. All crab apples are per se edible, but they range in being blah to like, <laughs> to like really good. Yeah. And when I showed up, these were loaded. This was years ago, and they're about the size of a quarter. Uh huh. And uh, they were absolutely delicious. They were so, so, so good. Yeah. And uh, it really opened my eyes how not to discriminate against a crab apple. So, but what we did with these is we actually grafted on big, delicious, tasty eating apples. This is a great technique because these were already established trees and then we just converted some of the branches so that this tree will produce the crab apples, which are good, as well as two or three other varieties of larger eating apples like you're used to in the store. So to graft these on, on this tree, what, what's the, the needs for that? 
Specifically with, with apples and pears, they have to be the same genus. The genus of apple is, is malice, and so as long as it falls under malice, um, it should take. Now, you know, it is kind of plant surgery, so I mean, yeah. I think, you know, I think the success rating on our grass here was, a, was about 50%, and that can shift depending on the weather that happens over the next couple weeks and sure. different, different things. Especially if you're only gonna have one apple tree, for instance, you wanna make sure you do graft on another variety or two because that will increase your pollination and will actually make your tree more fruitful. And crab apples are really good pollinators, so it's a really good foundation to have as an apple tree to graft onto because it ensures good pollination. So we've got another uh, garden back here that looks really cool. Um, and it's got an, a very ornamental fence that we're working on here that looks like it's covered in blackberries. Yeah, every fence we build has to grow something. Yeah. Because why not? This garden was already established, but the chickens were getting in and, and eating everything. And so we mm -hmm. built this fence around it just high enough to keep the chickens out and then figured, well, hey, it's a perfect trellis, let's grow blackberries on it. Yeah. And the thornless blackberries are delicious. They are. And uh, they're a lot easier to deal with. I also see, is that an espaliated fruit tree back there? Yep, they're two pear trees. We started when they were just young whips and we've been training them over the years. They'll need a good prune in here once the weather cools down this winter, but they're really starting to fill out and they make a nice screen for the back there. And doing fruit trees like that, shaping them really is good for small spaces, you know, especially if you have just a small bed along a house, you can do an espalier tree, no problem. Yeah, and fruit trees in particular uh, react well to heavy pruning, right? Absolutely. It's good for them and it's good for the small space. So this is a really cool alternative to trying to grow grapes here, which can be difficult. Uh, these muscadines look really happy here and they're just kind of nestled on this fence row right here. They love growing here. This is a great example because if you already have a fence, you can grow them on there pretty easily. You have to prune and train a bit, but they really will grow without too much attention. And the fruit, and the fruit are really good. Are you gonna make like some nice wines out of it? You can, it's not gonna be like the wines that yeah. you're used to, uh -huh. but you know, in terms of just fresh eating, they're awesome, making jams or jellies, and even and even making the wine is really nice. Yeah, again, so, and, and they're pretty. And they're pretty. It, it's got a smaller leaf than a, looks like a typical grape too, and a little bit of a different green. But yeah, it's covered in fruit, unlike most of grape vines I've seen around here that's, right. that really struggle. So this is definitely one of my favorite ornamental and edible trees in the landscape, a uh, fig tree. And it's completely loaded with figs right now too. And it's really happy yeah. here. Yeah, so, so this, this is about 10 years old, this tree here. And it's on a southern facing brick wall, um, which is a really good spot for a fig. Um, as much sun as possible and thermal mass, right? So that's a brick wall, that's a stone wall. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really just any wall is, is a th enough thermal mass to really keep it going. I've had some dime back on mine a few years back when it got below zero, but other than that, it's been really tough, which is fun. One of the best trees as far as ornamental and edible that I, that I think we can grow in this area. Absolutely, my favorite variety, I've tested a lot of different varieties. The one that seems to be the best is Chicago Hardy because it fruits on first year growth. Wow, yeah. Which makes a big difference because as many people who have figs know, they will die back, especially right. in a hard winter. And so right. if we have Chicago Hardy, the first year growth starts producing figs right away, which makes it so that even in a hard year where the fig dies back, you still get good fruit set. So we've got a little rain garden over here that looks like it's got a couple different things in it. Yeah, yeah, so it, um, it's beautiful, edible, and functional. And Wonderful. we've got the back end over here, which is um, a lot of uh, 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 wildflower, perennial wildflowers that are supporting the, uh, the pollinators that are essential for our gardens and our fruit trees and, and a lot of the foods we love. Yeah. Um, we also have blueberries around the edge here, which obviously are delicious and do well in this type of situation because they don't like wet feet and rain gardens drain that water quickly. So blueberries are a good option for the edges of, of the rain garden. Codes has recently established some, some rules that are uh, really beneficial for uh, the uh, ecological landscape. It's now required to have rain gardens on, on, on sites, on new sites, new development, and the tree ordinance is being enforced. So uh, people have to build, uh, plant trees when they, when they build uh, a, new, a new home. Yeah, so with all those things, there's no reason why people shouldn't plant things that are ornamental and edible. 
correct. There's no good reason not to try it because it's fun, it's beautiful, and it's delicious. It's getting people out there and getting your friends and family and your neighbors involved in the landscape. Absolutely, it's, it's facilitating our relationship with, with the outdoors and in a way that's, that's super fun and inspiring. For inspiring garden tours, growing tips, and garden projects, visit our website at volunteergardener.org or on YouTube at the Volunteer Gardener channel and like us on Facebook.